My name is Charles Potters. I am an independent researcher. Well, my name is Beatrice Sonderhoff. Um, I studied in Australia. I have a degree in anthropology from the University of Queensland. This is an amazing set of circumstances where the stars align just right to create an unusual opportunity. Here's a situation where someone who was well-educated, um, had a curious mind, uh, decides after uh, finishing his secondary education that he's going to go on an archeological expedition. And through a series of uh, unusual events, befriends Margaret Mead. He, Ledoux, apparently was looking for an interesting place to do, uh, to go on expedition. He had studied anthropology at Harvard, and this is after he had graduated. But all of the expeditions that he had signed up for somehow fell through. So he was apparently loitering about the uh, Muse Museum of uh, Natural History. And Margaret Mead, who was, who was there, um, kind of found out about this guy just kind of loitering in the halls who was looking for a place to go on expedition. And so she called him in and said, hey, would you be interested in going to the lower Sepik River region? Now she had gone with her um, first husband, Ria Fortune, to um, part of the Sepik River and she would have passed through the Murik region, but she didn't actually stay there and do research. So she knew it's relatively easily accessible and nobody had really been there. Maybe there's a missionary or two there, but no anthropologist. And so she said, why don't you go there? So he's not going there to retrieve articles. He's not going there as a treasure hunter. He's going there on an anthropological mission with the idea that he's going to write a book. And so he was able to basically, within 10 days or so, pack up his bags in New York and then yeah, he can get on a ship and go over to Sydney, Australia. At the University of Sydney, he, he came armed with letters of introduction from Margaret Mead saying, you know, please take care of Louis-Pierre Ledoux, he's going to go to, on expedition to the Murich. And so armed with all these letters, letters of introduction and customs forms and this and that, he was then able to very quickly though, from Sydney, hop on a ship um, and that took him via Rabaul, New Britain to, um, to the mainland New Guinea. And then he had to hop onto a smaller ship, boats, whatever, to eventually get to the Murich region organizes and puts it together and he spends six months on the ground in this village in the Sepik River region. Uh, and then comes back with the intent of writing a book about all the information about this one particular village and this one particular group of people. For a variety of reasons it comes clear in short order that the book is not going to be written. And so all of the artifacts and all of the photographs and all of the observations that he made end up being crated, put away, sealed in the original crates, which we have right there, because that's how we opened them up, in 1938, by 1938, and put away, and then they're not opened for 85 years. Hi, I'm uh, Jason Iorio, owner and principal auctioneer here at Willow Auction House. The, uh, the collection uh, we actually uh, got from his estate, which uh, through one of the law firms that we work with, mostly what we do is estate dispersion. Uh, we uh, were called upon to break down his uh, home in the Hudson Valley in Cornwall, Hudson. And uh, that is where the collection was sitting since 1936. When we, uh, you know, received the call, we did we did a walkthrough. We go on a visit first. So first, you know, uh, going there and then, you know, um, not knowing anything about Ledoux and his family members being like, well, you know, here there's all this stuff. Let's walk through the house. And then kind of as an afterthought, hey, there's you know. There's this stuff, he went to Papua New Guinea and, you know, he brought back some of this stuff, was kind of the way it was. And there was, you know, just some uh, of these masks laying around. But in the basement, uh, where it, you know, walks out uh, to the to a garage and everything, this just concrete floor basement, the, the boxes with all the smaller stuff were stacked just in, in a corner of a room with a bunch of storage stuff in it. So we got the opportunity to open this up and try to decipher 
what it was, not just what these objects are, but what he was looking at. And that's really what we were trying to do. We were trying to recreate his anthropologic expedition and understand what has been hidden from view for nearly nine decades. I saw the objects in the raw and I couldn't believe it because th these kinds of objects are, you know, possibly seen in a museum context, but not, you know, they would be sanitized already. Whereas this was in the raw, you could basically smell New Guinea um, air, you could, you could, you could like feel the dust on these objects that, that hadn't been seen in, um, you know, over 80 years. And so it's his observations and then his conclusions made from his observations. And so there are lots of things that we have, for example, the, the basket bags. We have a whole, um, he explains that they were extremely valuable to the New York people because they were their um, trade objects. So nobody else in the region would make these baskets, but they were very, very important. One of the things for me, which may be not the most important objects, one of the things that I'm most impressed with is one of the things that he brought back was a large collection of handmade bags uh, that were woven uh, in the village. Now, they may not be the most valuable objects, but they are in near perfect condition. And they simply don't exist anywhere in the world because they are basically grass bags and all of the ones from the period that are 100 year old bags have disappeared we have probably more than 20 25 bags that are not only in pretty good condition they are basically in mint condition as if they were made last week it was the women who made these very valuable baskets that the men would take on their trade missions to offshore islands and elsewhere where they would trade these bags for, you know, things like pigs, things like um, sago, uh, jewelry, whatever. Um, and so that was all documented in Ledoux's manuscript. They are the soul of that society at the time. Without the basket bags, nothing would happen. So they and the fact that they are in great condition and you can see that, you know, some of them are older looking, some of them are basically pristine because the pristine ones were used to trade. So they had to be pristine. Others, you know, may have been used within the village already anyway, but that is just, without, without those basket bags, that society would not exist the way it did. It's really, really interesting to see all these objects that were actually used for a particular purpose. We have <laughs> at least 20 ceremonial masks, every one of them different, every one of them uh, uh, exemplifying a different spirit, as it were. I don't mean that literally, but just the essence of what, they, uh, what you feel when you look at them. They're called brag masks. Um, brag actually is another term for ancestor. So they're ancestor uh, masks and you would wear them, either attach them to, to your own um, ceremonial costume or they would be attached to possibly um, a flute. So they have flute masks as well, smaller ones. Um, and what is interesting is in the Muric region, um, they have a certain shape um, and they have this big hook nose oftentimes, not all the time. And so you can recognize kind of stylistically where they would have been from. These are these masks are, are, are probably uh, conservatively uh, 100 years old. You just don't see these things coming onto the market at all now. They do not exist. That would be one or two or three where something comes out that is come out of nowhere. We have 20. We have mm, 25 different figures that have never been seen before. I can virtually tell you that I've been doing this for 50 years. I have never seen such a comprehensive collection of anything from any single collection quite like this. And it is unlikely that we'll see a collection like this again.
The whole collection is an insight into real history, Western history in terms of Ledoux being a Westerner going to New Guinea. At the same time, it is testament um, to local traditional life, at least in the 1930s, in New Guinea. Um, that hasn't really been documented before and where that history, that tradition may have been lost because of all the huge changes that happened with the Second World War and modernization and everything. For someone who does what I do, which is looks at things and touches things and tries to analyze them, this has been exciting. And I don't use that word too often. <laughs>